Now, we're going to be walking through Romans 12. We're going to finish Romans chapter 12 today and look at verses 9 through 21. So if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and find Romans chapter 12. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we would love to gift one of those to you, and we will have them in the back of the room on the Connect table. Uh, And you can also follow along with me by the words on the screen. Uh, Now, whenever the Oaks first started, I wore several different hats. Uh, One of those was our church graphic designer. And I'm very grateful that now we have Grace, who does that job very well. We have an entire creative team that does a lot of the graphic design. uh, But it wasn't completely foreign to me because throughout high school, I worked at a screen printing shop, you know, making t-shirts and that kind of thing. Throughout college, it was kind of like uh, a side job that I did to do logo development and that kind of thing. So whenever we started the Oaks, I wanted to help people visualize discipleship using the four core values that we had at the time as a church. And so I created an image that would depict our four core values at the time, which were gospel story, identity, mission, and family. And it looked something like this. Uh, and, And I wanted each image to come together to create a single logo, if you will, that described the Christian life. First, the circle is gospel story, because the gospel, hearing the the story of what God has been doing and has done to save his people, it changes your entire worldview. It changes your entire life. You, whenever you believe that, it it changes everything, and now you live within that circle. We often say that the gospel isn't just the front door into Christianity, it's the entire house that you live the Christian life in. Next, that creates a new identity where your, gospel, your, your life is now centered in this gospel. You've been crucified with Christ, and you now live to bring him glory. This identity is in the cross. Theologians call this the cruciform life, and so we're now centered in the gospel. And then there are two repercussions that flow from that new identity, that new reality. One is inward, and one is outward depicted by the third value that we have, which is family, these arrows pointing inward. We're constantly, within the community that this gospel has created, we're constantly pointing people in to focus on Christ, and that gives us both a privilege and responsibility to love one another well. And fourth and finally, there is now an an outward responsibility, and that is to make Christ known. For those who are maybe curious about Christianity or have never given their life to Christ, they don't have a personal relationship with Christ, because of the Great Commission, it is both a responsibility and privilege and honor and also a matter of obedience to take this gospel outward to others. Now, although this image has not seen the light of day since probably fall of 2017, It was brought to mind again this week because as I studied Romans 12 and as I've seen us walk from verses 1 through verse 21, I think that this is not just an image that was in our starting point booklet a long time ago, but I think it's a good depiction of the Christian life as a whole that Paul would start in Romans 12 saying, because of God's mercy to you when you were in your sin, now you are a living sacrifice. Present your bodies to the Lord. You have a new identity. Because of what God has already done, now go do this. And he's going to talk about our new identity. He's going to talk about how we love the church family, much of what we saw last week in exercising our gifts to serve one another. And today he's going to talk about the character of the, of the Christian life, the way that we interact with one another, the way that you intentionally think about the brother or sister that is sitting next to you in this room. He's also going to talk about our responsibility to those who are in the world. How how should we respond when we're ridiculed? In, In what way should we react whenever we feel pressure from the world around us? How can we have a heart that is focused on two things because of God's love toward us? A genuine love for others and a desire to be a light to the world. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. That because you have been loved by God, you are now called to love one another and be a light to the world. How would I summarize Romans 12, 9 through 21 in this way? You have been loved by God to love one another and be a light to the world. Now here's the deal. Verses 9 through 21 are very straightforward. 
You don't have to dust off your exegetical commentary or dig into the Greek understanding of these words to understand verses 9 through 21. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to do all of that. But the difficulty in this passage is not the information that we receive, but the application of this information. I mean, as we walk through this text and as I've been wrestling with it all week, I I realize that my flesh... The the sinful flesh that still wages war within me bristles against the commands that Paul is going to lay out here. But that should create a genuine humility in us, a dependence upon the Lord, and the Holy Spirit actively working in us to be faithful to the commands that now lay before us, that are given by God through Paul, the apostle. So with that being said, let's look at verses 9 through 21, and we'll unpack it a little bit. Verse 9 says this, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Two general statements before we begin to look at this passage in depth. First, I want you to see that all of these commands presuppose a Christian community. You cannot be faithful to obey these one another's in isolation. And so it's important to be a part of a a body, a local church that you're committed to, where uh, you're living amongst fellow believers who know you and you know them. I'll also say that this passage gives us an outline of what obedience looks like. But these are not optional characteristics of a very mature Christian. And I think sometimes we can read parts of the Bible like that. We can say like, okay, well, this is more like varsity level stuff, and I'm I'm not really there yet. Or I kind of struggle with this one, or this doesn't really fit my personality. And what Paul is saying here is to do otherwise is sin. I mean, he's going to say in verse 9, let your love be genuine. But to read that in the inverse would be, it is sinful whenever you love someone just for the sake of what you can gain, or if it's simply for the fact to be observed by others, right? So he's laying out both the pattern of obedience in the Christian life, but to look at this from another angle would also be to acknowledge that not taking these commands seriously is sin. And it's not just kind of an optional or or suggested advice for those who really take God's word seriously. Now, we're going to look at two commands, and if you love notes, like today is your day, all right? I'm going all the way A through H on point one, all right? But we're going to do a staccato, so don't, so don't worry. Um, and if that, if that statement just stressed you out, then don't worry about it, right? Because all the notes can be found in the weekly email, and you can just sit and just absorb, all right? So hopefully that alleviates some pressure for some of you who, who feel like you might need to grab the pen beside you because you could run out of ink before the day is over. Two commands, and and I say that because, you know, uh, theologians, commentaries have categorized these in all kinds of different ways, but really they all fall under the heading of love, all right? So because God has loved us, we now love Him, and our vertical love for God is now displayed horizontally through our love for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and our love for the world around us, and that's what you see as you walk through this passage. So, First, let me give you the inward command. And I would say that that fits into verses 9 through 16. The inward command is to love one another. It's simple, 
as I said, and yet its application can be rather difficult. What is the first command that Paul gives? I'm going to give you a few descriptors of love as we walk through verses 9 through 16. That your love should be genuine. He says, our love should be genuine. The word that is used here for genuine is on Hippocrates. The word that is our source for the word hypocritical or hypocrite. He's saying, your love should not be hypocritical. You should not be motivated by simply what you can get in return for loving, someone other, uh, so, for loving another or loving someone else. This should be a genuine love that is not hypocritical. Uh, the word that Paul uses here is a word that I'm sure that you have heard either at weddings or in other sermons. It's the word agape. Uh, agape love is different. It's, it's a love that is, is reflective of the love of God. Uh, there is a, there's a book that is written by um, a woman named Jen Wilkin, and it's called In His Image. And it's a really good book. Um, it has a bright coral cover on it with a beautiful flower. So maybe you're a guy and you're like, I just don't think I would read that. I, I really encourage everybody to pick it up because what she does in that book is she walks through the incommunicable or the communicable attributes of God, which are the attributes of God that we are able to reflect as those made in His image. And she describes agape love in this way. She says that agape love is not based upon reciprocity, right? So we're, we're not seeking a transaction. If you're, if you're thinking right now, is my love genuine? Run it through that filter. Am, am I seeking reciprocity? Am I, am I giving love in order to gain recognition? Is my love ever a way to manipulate someone else into doing what I want to do. Well, that's not agape love. At the end of the day, that's love of self, not love of one another. Uh, Another point that she makes is that agape love doesn't weigh the worth of the object. It is easy for us to love that which is beautiful or successful or powerful, but look at the love of God who loved us when we were dead in our sin and had, we have absolutely nothing to add to God. He is sufficient within himself, and yet he loves us. See, agape love loves at sacrificial personal cost. And so ask yourself, is my love genuine? Is my love like the Lord's? And, and while I think we could, we could say, man, it's, it is difficult to exhibit this kind of love which is where it's important for us to be reminded of what we read in our scripture reading plan this week. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, gives us the motivation for being able to love in this way at our own personal cost. It is a love that Christ has shown us, for Christ's love compels us. Like the wind in our sails compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We don't live for ourselves anymore. We don't have to love someone in order to gain something from them because God has given us everything we need. And now the love of Christ is this fountain that never needs to be replenished that supplies all the love that we direct toward those around us. And because Christ died for us, we now live for him. But look at Paul's argument as it continues. He's saying, let love be genuine. And then he says, abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. This is actually a a, a pretty direct statement. He's saying that you should hate what is evil. And that you should hold fast to what is good. Now, does that sound contrary to love? It shouldn't. Because if you truly love something then you will hate what contradicts it. All right, so let's use an example that every Bengals room, uh, fan in the room can relate with, right? If you, if you love the Bengals, then you hate Steelers, Chiefs, Browns, you know, like, I mean, you can, you can go through the list, right? Or maybe we just say highly dislike because we're in church, but I know 1 p.m., well, more like 3 p.m. a couple of Sundays ago, Hate, hate the Browns, all right? Because I, because I love my children, I hate when they're sick. I hate when they run a fever. I hate when they look puny, right? When we love 
what is good and righteous, we hate what is evil. Now, I think this point needs to perhaps be examined more now than ever because there is a distortion of love that is running rampant in our culture. And when we distort God's definition of love, whenever we try to warp it into our worldly way of thinking, you hear things like, love accepts and affirms everything. Love, love accepts and, and affirms everything. Everything goes. And, and the dangerous thing is that that way of thinking has even crept into those who would say that they hold fast to the love of God and the way that that should be expressed. I'm not making a, a hypothetical point here. This upcoming weekend, one of the largest churches in Georgia will host an event called the Unconditional Conference. And and the purpose behind the unconditional conference is to rally the church together to support the LGBTQ plus community. And I know this is a sensitive topic, but it's worth stating in a context like this. Whenever you look at that event, if you were to read the website, you would hear the affirmation of sin blatantly couched in comfortable language like, We seek to build bridges. We want to bring healing. We want to provide a quiet middle space for conversation. And it's like, man, at the Oaks, we would say, we want to bring healing to people. Sin has created all kinds of problems. We want to build bridges so that other people would know the Lord better. We want to have meaningful conversations with that. And yet, these these things that that are truly unloving and misleading are being hidden under words that most Christians would say, that sounds like a really good thing. And while it's not our aim to be unnecessarily offensive, we must be biblical. It's not our aim to be unnecessarily offensive. But if we want to truly be loving, we must tell the truth. There's a way to exhibit grace, truth, and love while not affirming sin. Here's the deal. Each one of us, every single one of us, can humbly say that there are sinful desires in our hearts, that there are fleshly temptations that run contrary to God's word within us right now. I know I can say that, and I know that you can say that. We daily wage war against the proclivities of our flesh to go contrary to God's word and to desire something that was not a part of God's original design. That's called sin. And at the same time, there's nothing less loving Nothing less genuine than supporting sin. Now, don't get me wrong, and hear me when I say this. The Oaks Church is a place and should be a place where you can say, I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with anger. I'm struggling with pride. I'm struggling with same sex attraction. I'm struggling with bitterness towards someone else. We can openly confess that those are temptations that people in this room, that we all experience in some sort, form, or fashion. And yet, we confess our sin honestly and openly, seeing Jesus as the solution. Because what do we say again and again at the Oaks Church? That Jesus loves us enough to meet us where we were at, but too much to let us stay there. And so, we abhor what is evil. We're not, we're not just going to try to, you know, just brush it over and say like, hey, it's, it's fine if you never forgive that person. It's fine if you never seek reconciliation there, even though that would be more comfortable. Maybe, maybe viewing it in an issue like that that's not as volatile is easy. But here, I'm committed to helping you grow in this, to seeing sin as sin and Christ as a very powerful Savior wherever someone's at so that we can go to war with our own sin, right? That's the ultimate application here, is that we would hate the sin that was within us because it is the very reason that Christ our Savior was crucified. But praise be to God, He is resurrected, the tomb is empty, and that sin stands against us no more. So let us not celebrate what is evil. Let us call it sin and point to the God who restores, walking alongside others who are burdened by that weight. We want our love to be genuine, to abhor what is evil, to hold fast to what is good. 
Next, love honors one another. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. When we get to verse 10, Paul expounds on the way that we display this love. You actually know the Greek word that's there in the text because it's Philadelphia. Well, it's not exactly, it's Philadelphia, but it, you, you know that that means the city of brotherly love. And whenever he says brotherly affection, he is here referring to that family relationship that exists within the church. Now, this is important because in Paul's Roman context, you would have people that are now in this church body that were once on completely different planes of the, the society's hierarchy, all right? But now they're family. So you have someone who was high up in nobility, uh, the kind of person that other people listen to. He is served or she is served and doesn't serve others. And yet, in the Christian community, in this new Roman church that is now made equal through the power of the gospel, you have the nobility serving the slave, right? There's this brotherly affection that now exists that could only be made possible through the gospel. This kind of love replaces our sinful tendency to be jealous of others with a desire to now honor one another, to outdo one another in honor. Right? I mean, sometimes whenever you see someone else getting celebrated, you're kind of like, oh man, I wish I was getting the credit or the attention. And yet, because of the gospel, you're the one that's elevating someone, encouraging them for their gifts and what you see at work in their lives, seeking to honor them. Third, we serve one another. Verse 11 says, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Now, I believe that this passage applies to everyone, but perhaps it's a little more relevant for the Christian who has walked with the Lord for a long time. Uh, I, I think that, you know, maybe it's easy if you've uh, been a Christian for several years, you've been baptized, you know, maybe a decade ago, to need the reminder, be fervent in, in your service of the Lord. Uh, don't grow lax. And I know that as time goes on, life's demands get, get greater and greater. And yet, what Paul is saying here is, hey, don't, don't let your zeal wane. Remember what God has done for you. Don't let all of your service of the Lord be in the past tense. You know, I mean, I know that some of you, I don't, but have that Thanksgiving or that, that uncle at Thanksgiving, you know, and you have the Thanksgiving meal and you're like, man, this is, I never know what's going to happen. And then you have that uncle who spends like the whole time talking about how good he was at football in high school. You know, it's like the Uncle Rico Christian who's like, man, back in my day, I could throw a pigskin a quarter mile. You know, if they would have just put me in a, at the state championship, we would have won, you know, that like you don't want your Christian life to be all about, like whenever you think about those radical moments of faith or that risky courage for the sake of the gospel where you had the conversation or, you know, went on the mission trip, you don't want all of that stuff to be like the, that it happened the first six months that you were a Christian or that it was all, yeah, like, you know, it was this camp in high school or this ministry that I was a part of in college. Like Paul is saying, be zealous, be fervent, serve the Lord now. You don't want to look back on your life and think about what you could have done for the kingdom of God. He's saying, be zealous, be fervent. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you, you have a friend who's hurting and, and maybe just kind of apathetic in the faith. What would it look like for you to come alongside them, to pray for them, and say, brother or sister, you're, you've got gifts. And I want you to use them. And here, here are a couple people that I, that I think could really benefit from hearing from your experience and walking through life with you. And you just come alongside them and encourage them. That's what a healthy church does. And that is the way that, that a mature Christian helps another mature in their faith. Next, love patiently endures with joy and prayer. Look at verse 12. He says, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. He's saying be patient and pray in the midst of it. The, the church in Rome was under brutal persecution. 
constantly. And it was only going to ramp up uh, after the days that this letter was written. And so Paul is saying, endure tribulation. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in your tribulation and be constant in prayer. Uh, I, I know that many times we've been watching a, a movie, a kid's movie, not a movie that's scary, but my boys have said, can we just fast forward this, right? Like, you know, the, the moment that Ryder is stuck on the side of the building in the Paw Patrol movie. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've fast forwarded through that scene just so that we can get to the part where Chase saves him, okay? If you know, you know. And so... It was, sometimes we want to do that with God, right? We're not patient in tribulation. We were just be like, hey, like, if you could hurry this up, like, this is hard. And yet, I want, you to, I want you to hear Paul saying, be patient in tribulation. This is to be expected in the Christian life. And God in his sovereign providence is doing things in you and through you that can't be rushed. And that's hard to trust him in that. But the good news is our patience isn't passive. Because what does Paul say? You still have hope. There is a hope both now in Christ that he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That you can claim the promise of David in Psalm 34, I have seen the cubs of lions go hungry, but the children of God, I've never seen lack or want. You can rejoice in the hope that regardless of what suffering in this life might bring, There is an eternal weight of glory that you you cannot calculate in numbers that we know right now. You can rejoice in hope. You can be patient and you can be constant in prayer. If Paul has to say this of all people, then we have to know that our natural tendency is not just to go to God in prayer with these burdens, but to try to fix them ourselves. And so we, we must say we need to be intentional, be constant in prayer. When we are tempted to give up, we can look up to the Lord who is sovereign over it all. Love sacrifices for the needs of others. Paul says in verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Our church is very generous. I've seen this in a myriad of ways, but perhaps one comes to mind more notably right now, and it is the fact that we were just able to send two missionaries of our own to Spain, Josh and Michelle Lovett. And through their willingness to go and to serve as missionaries, I have seen this contribution of the saints for the needs of others play out. Um, Through our church body and just the generosity of other Christians that they are friends and and family with, they were able to raise over $33,000 up to this point to go be missionaries in Spain to discern what God has next for them, potentially church planting in Spain. And so their financial needs were met so that they could go. Uh, But not only that, they needed a place to stay for a short amount of time after they got married, and it's really hard to lease a place for less than a year. But they threw that out, and the Oaks folks grouped me, and Jack and Jasmine Blair said, we just fixed up, uh, you know, part of our house that we're using as a duplex to be rented out as an Airbnb, but you know what? We're going to forego that so that you can live in this space and rent it from us uh, for for a a short amount of time, because we know that you can't do that anywhere else. And and the amazing thing is there was another couple in our congregation that needed a car and they're like, we don't know what we're going to do because we need a car. And the Lovitz heard that need and said, well, we're about to be in Spain for a year. We're not going to need our car. You take our car. You can keep it running for us. And then the Lovett said, we've got all of this stuff and we have no idea where to store it and storage units are really expensive. And the Dodds just bought a house and they said, we've got a lot of room in our basement, just store everything in there. And so they stored it so that there would be no expense to the Lovett's at all. That is how God in his sovereign providence has designed the church to meet one another's needs so that we can contribute to the needs of the saints. Now, some of those were financial, Uh, Some of those were tangible. All of them were hospitable. Paul says here, seek to show hospitality. Uh, We don't just view our homes as private castles to entreat, to treat, like just to get a retreat in. Uh, We view our homes, our dinner tables as opportunities to love other people. Hospitality is not simply about hosting people. Hospitality is also uh, a way of life that invites people to, you know, 
to come into your life. Uh, we often say at the Oaks that uh, we want to intersect and not add when it comes to the Christian life and the biblical community. We value intersection over addition. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've been around for a few years, you've often heard the phrase, add people to your things and not just things to your schedule. And whenever you begin to think like that, you, you're like, man, I, I'm supposed to disciple people. I'm supposed to serve people. I'm supposed to know the needs of others. Like, I don't have time for all this. I'm working a 40 plus hour a week job. I'm going to school. I've got all these responsibilities as a family. But if you begin to think, add people to my things, not things to my schedule, you're like, oh, I've got 21 meals that I typically eat a week, three meals a day. I'll just add, I'll just see if someone wants to come over and eat, or if I can be intentional about the person that I grab lunch with. If maybe you're saying, you know, I, I go on a run at 6 a.m., uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's like, was well, there anybody in your missional community group that also goes on a run a few weeks out of the morning? Maybe you just intersect so that you can get to know them a little bit better. Maybe you're taking the kids to the park and you just have a, a group chat and you'd say, hey, we're going to be at this park at, you know, 2 p.m. tomorrow. Does anybody else want to join? So that we can show hospitality to one another. Because you'll often find that ministry takes place in the margins of life. And so we want to intersect our lives with other people so that God can be at work among our personal relationships. Next, Paul says that love blesses one another. How should we handle opposition? We should bless those who persecute us. That's what Paul says here. Bless those who persecute you. Bless you and do not curse them. Now, in Paul's Roman context, uh, there was this superstition that if you cursed someone and inscribed it on a stone tablet, that that curse would come to pass. All right? And uh, it was like a, an ancient form of Twitter or something. You know, there, there are these uh, artifacts that have been discovered, and some of them are just comical, and we don't have time to, to get into now. There's this scathing curse tablet about uh, this man who got his gloves stolen at the bathhouse, and he was just like really letting the other guy have it, okay? So, but Paul here is saying the culture around you is... It's saying, yeah, slander other people that get in your way. Gossip about other people. Because the more that you can tear somebody down, especially if you feel attacked, the better you feel about yourself. The, the better you will appear in the eyes of others. And Paul here is being countercultural and saying, no, bless one another. Trust God with those who might curse you. Your aim is to bless and love one another. So, as Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. We love as Christ loved us when we were his enemies. Love shares in the celebration and the suffering of one another. Love shares in the celebration of one another and in the suffering of one another. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now, the unspoken pre prerequisite of this command is that you must know one another. You got to know what's going on in somebody's life to be able to rejoice with them. You got to know what's going on in somebody's life to be able to weep with them. Proximity does not always equal community, right? So, sometimes it does. It's certainly necessary, but proximity, just being close to someone, doesn't equal community with someone. And, and so we must seek to get to know others. We must let other people know us. If there is something that you're rejoicing about, Share it with other people so that they can praise God with you. If there's something that is difficult for you, share it with someone else so that they can bear your burden alongside you. That's how the church has been designed. We are so naturally nearsighted that we must be told this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I, I think I experienced this most tangibly in our missional community group. Uh, you know, last year was our oldest son's first year of kindergarten. And if you can think back to your elementary days, then you know that one of the most important days of the year was the day of your Valentine's Day party. Right? Did anybody else feel like that? It's like you go to the store with your mom and you pick out the, your, and your, you pick out whatever your character is or TV show, and then you're looking through your Valentine's Day card and you're like, oh, she is definitely getting this one, right? <laughs> or he is, he is definitely getting this one. And you're, you're, you're like, you know, and then you, and you come home that day and you've got your Valentine's Day cards and candy from everybody and you're just going through them and you're just beaming. It's like so exciting. Well, we had gone through that whole process and then the day before the Valentine's Day party, Brooks's first Valentine's Day party of elementary school, he started running a fever. So we're like, 
buddy, I'm so sorry. Like, you're not going to be able to go to the Valentine's Day party. And he was just crushed, right? He had decorated his little box that he was going to take. And, you know, it's just like, oh, man. And, you know, I meet with Connor once a week uh, to just do accountability and discipleship. And so, you know, I, I mentioned it in passing just because it's a hard thing in our week. But what was so cool is, unbeknownst to me, he had texted every person in our missional community group. And he had explained the situation, and <laughs> such a dad, right? And, and, he, and he, said, he said, hey, this is what happened to Brooks. You know, he was excited about his Valentine's Day party. He's not going to be able to go. And he said, um, if you get the chance, bring a Valentine's Day card and candy. And uh, so there Brooks is. He's sitting on the floor. He has no idea that this is about to happen. You know, five-year-old little guy sitting there, still feeling kind of weak and sick. And one by one, each person came into our house and handed him a Valentine's Day card and a, and a piece of candy. And just, and I mean, his eyes lit up, right? He, he could not believe that there were adults who would consider him in such a way and, and to love him like that. And as I reflected on that, I just said, Lord, this is better than a kindergarten Valentine's Day party. Because my five-year-old has just learned a valuable lesson in ecclesiology. Right, he has just learned, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, my prayers are weird, y'all, uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> he's just learned this valuable lesson about who the church is, right, that we see the needs of others. We go out of our way at personal cost to ourselves to meet them because we are a people who know what it's like for one to weep with us. Is that not what Christ himself has done? Sympathizing with our weaknesses as our great high priest and as those who have been given the Holy Spirit now to be a priest of this grace to others, to see the needs of others, to come alongside them and to weep alongside them that they may know the love of God. That's what the church does. That's what you guys are known for. And you do it in ways that I don't even know about. That's what the church does. We love others as Christ has first loved us. Finally, on this point, we pursue unity. We talked a lot last week about the diversity of gifts in the church. And it can be easy to compare whenever other people have different gifts in the church body. And Paul is saying here, even in that diversity, there should be great unity because we are one body saying in verse 16, do not be haughty or live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So those are the inward commitments that we make. That is what love is within the church body. But we should also look at the outward command that we should be a light to those in the dark. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. First, you should trust God and not seek revenge. You should trust God's plan. And whenever you are wronged by someone else, specifically those that are outside of the Christian community, you shouldn't seek to get even or to get ahead or to take revenge on that. Now, this is, uh, this is an embarrassing story for me to tell, and maybe I just shouldn't, but maybe it gives you a, a, a picture of how I feel whenever I've experienced injustice, okay? So, um, one night, I'm going to get dinner at Taco Bell, and someone cuts me off as I'm getting into the Taco Bell on Red Bank. You know, you have to circle the whole building and then pull in, and then someone just whoosh, whipped right in there. And it was a cab service, that had the number of the cab service plastered over the bumper, and I'm so petty, you know what I'm about to do. Okay, so were we together? Were you? Okay, yeah, so my whole family was in the car. It was a real shining moment for me. So, so I'm like, I'm going to call him. I'm going to call and talk to his manager and, you know, say this is happening. So I, I called the cab service, and I'm like, hey, I would like to speak uh, with the manager to report one of your drivers. And, and this guy's like, well, 
what's the situation? And I said, well, I was pulling into Taco Bell and one of your drivers cut me off and I think that was really rude. And he said, I'm in front of you trying to order tacos right now. <laughs> he said, I am the manager. And then he hung up. And I was like, I was like, well, that did not go as planned. And my wife is just sitting silently next to me because she has seen that scenario play out more times than I'm willing to, to admit. What, what Paul is saying here is trust the Lord with injustice. And while, and while that is the, a silly example, I know that some of you are sitting here right now and you're like, but you don't understand what I've gone through. I know that as your pastor, I know that because I've sat across from you, I know that because of your prayer cards, and I know that some of you are thinking, I, you don't know what has been done to me, you don't know what has been said about me, you don't know what kind of injustice I've experienced. And I want you to know that while I might not be able to fully relate to that, God knows, God sees, and God cares. And he is a God who is just and good. And while you may not see the full justice that you desire in this life, That one day Christ will return. He will make all things new. He will judge the living and the dead in every single sin that has perhaps, every every sin that is done against you will be accounted for, either absorbed in the body of Christ and washed away by his blood or punished eternally in a conscious place called hell. Because sin is serious. Sin is serious that is committed against a holy God. If you read through the book of of Nahum this week in our Bible reading plan, some of that's hard to stomach. And yet think about the great comfort it would have been to the Israelites as they're thinking about the Ninevites that seem to just be getting away with everything. And they're like, oh Lord, how long? He's saying, in my timing, trust me, draw near to me. I'm going to exact justice in this situation. Trust my timing. Just why here we can read in verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We can trust the Lord's timing and not repay evil when it is done. Verse 18 says, As as far as it is possible for you, live peaceably with others. There are going to be times that you seek peace with someone else, that perhaps you seek reconciliation, uh, that they do not repent to you, and in those moments, you will have sought peace as far as it depends upon you. But there are times when conflict arises that there is no more that you can do to create peace in that situation, and so you trust the Lord. You say, I I'm not going to be bitter toward this person. I'm not going to harbor resentment. I'm going to trust the Lord with it. So seek peace and know that, know that there are things that you can be a part of there and, and other things that are out of your hands and be okay with that. So we trust God. We don't seek revenge. We leave, live peaceably and we love our enemies. Do you notice how Paul begins verse 19? He says, beloved. Why does he do that? I think it's really intentional that he he reminds the church here, you are loved by God. Why would he do that? Because there is great temptation to believe the lie that God doesn't care and that God doesn't love you whenever you are facing difficult circumstances, especially whenever you are experiencing uh, difficulty at the hands of another. He's saying, hey, you might not feel loved by other people right now, but you are the beloved of God. And he cares about you. He loves you. And he has gone to great lengths to prove that to you. And so what is our responsibility? To bless our enemy. To feed them when they're hungry. To, to give them a drink when they are thirsty. It says in verse 20 that that would be like pouring coals upon their head. Perhaps to wake them up to the reality of the gospel. That these coals would purify their soul as Isaiah was purified when the coal touched his lips, that it would wake them up out of their sinful state when they experience the kindness of another. As I thought about this, I was reminded of the story of the Apostle James's martyrdom. Uh, you might be familiar with the story that there was an executor that was assigned to behead him, 
And James, being both bold but humble, began to walk with that executioner to the place that he would be beheaded. And he just began to tell that man about the love of Christ. He began to say, hey, God can forgive anything that you've done. Like this, is, this doesn't have to define you. You can have eternal life in Christ, my Lord. This is my hope. This is my salvation. And by the time that James goes to take a knee to be beheaded, the executioner hands his sword to another and says, I am a follower of Christ. In hearing what he has said to me, on the path to his own execution, I have decided that Christ is my Savior. He has forgiven my sins, and now I give my life to him and take a need to be martyred alongside my now brother in Christ. So why don't we retaliate? Why don't we seek revenge? Why do we live peaceably? Why do we have this kind of posture toward those around us? Because we are eager that they may be welcomed into the family of God and know the Lord as we do. Perhaps we should end the same place that we began, with the mercy of God. That's what Romans 12 is all about. And I say that for two reasons. Uh, One, because we can hear a passage, a ton of commands like this, and slip into two ditches. Uh, One would be resolution, and the other would be resignation. All right, so resolution would say, this is a lot, but I think I can do it. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to, you know, really buckle down, and I'm going to make this happen. And if you do that, you're either going to be exhausted or prideful, right? Right? Because you can't do this in your own strength, or if you start to see progress and you're not dependent upon the Lord, you're going to be like, I'm great. Resolution isn't the solution here. We could, we could also slip into resignation and just say, I can't do this. This is too much for me. All these commands, like, I, forget it. I'll leave it to the other Christians. But the gospel says, you can't do this. Christ did this on your behalf. Now, Christ has saved you, redeemed you, is committed to your sanctification, lives within you through the Holy Spirit so that you can imperfectly go and do these things. Not resolution, not resignation, but redemption in Christ our Lord. Perhaps it's helpful to make a few statements in closing. These commands are impossible without a big view of the gospel. That's why I had Jordan read 1 John 4, 7 through 11. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God has loved you. And if that sinks in, then you will desire to love others. Second observation, these are commands to follow, but not demands to make. All right, so these are commands for you to follow. These are not demands for you to make of other people, your spouse, your children, your friends. Help them along, pray for them, but, but you are not God. Third, these commands require relationships. We've stated that. First Thessalonians 2.8, Paul says, we didn't just share the gospel with you, we shared our own lives with you. It gives this gospel teeth. Fourth, these commands are countercultural. How did Jesus say that the world would know that you are my disciples? By the way that you love one another. By the way that you love one another. As we come to the end of this sermon, I want you to see that the truths that are in this text do not need to be illustrated by an image on a screen or a little logo in a booklet. No, because these truths are seen in you, a redeemed image bearer of our redeeming God. Let's pray.